Okay, hi everybody. We're gonna go ahead and, and get started as folks filter in. Welcome to the Caretaking for Climate Resilience virtual session at Capitol Hill Ocean Week, where we're so glad you can join us. My name is Jillian Neuberger. I am a climate associate with the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, and I support the NOAA National Marine Protected Area Center and Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Uh, and I am gonna be your moderator for today's session. Uh, this session was organized by the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, uh, which is the trustee for our National Marine Sanctuary System, uh, a network of underwater parks that cover more than 620,000 uh, square miles of Great Lakes and marine waters. Um, and across the system from Florida Keys to Lake Huron to American Samoa, we are already seeing the intensifying impacts uh, of climate change. And as we look to improve our management in the context of a changing ocean, we are, are thinking about how we can adapt our sites to be resilient uh, in the face of, of climate change um, and to contribute to broader uh, nature-based climate change solutions. And if that's something you're interested in, I encourage you to, to screenshot this slide or I can send you the links and to check out our uh, website on climate change and national marine sanctuaries, which houses all of our resources, including resources on how uh, we're implementing adaptation across sanctuaries um, and how you can consider things like climate vulnerability uh, when you're managing marine protected areas. Um, and of course, uh, I'm always happy to talk to folks about this work, our whole team is, so feel free uh, to get in touch. I've included my email here and I'm happy to, to drop it in the chat as well if that's helpful. But today, um, we're here to talk about something a little bit um, more, more broad, um, and that is caretaking for climate resilience. You know, sanctuaries are just one of many um, folks, groups, individuals, um, communities looking to uh, caretake for, uh, or take care of um, their special marine places. Um, and in communities in particular, and sometimes in partnership with local state and federal governments have been real leaders in, uh, in determining and, and identifying uh, and then implementing um, climate resilient solutions uh, in vital marine spaces. And so what we wanna talk about today and what this session will discuss is some of the tools and approaches that national marine sanctuaries and our partners um, and those in communities uh, near national marine sanctuaries, what they're using to uh, advance this work and our shared understanding of caretaking for climate resilience. And I'm really excited to say we have some phenomenal uh, panelists here with us today. Uh, they're gonna share their experience with you um, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So if you have questions come up, please uh, jot them down as we go. Um, and I'm just gonna introduce uh, your panelists now. So first you're gonna hear from Dr. Kelly Dunning. Kelly is an associate professor at Auburn University College of Forestry, Wildlife and the Environment. She is a National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine Early Career Fellow and a National Center for Atmospheric Research Early Career Researcher and Scientist. Her work looks at public policy for sustainable coastal and ocean systems. After you hear from Kelly, uh, you're gonna hear from three very generous souls that are joining us from crack of dawn uh, in Hawaii. Um, we will talk about their, uh, their collective and, and individual work. Uh, that includes Mahialani Bambiko. Building a strong Kalina or connection to culture, place and people has always been a focus for Mahialani. She has worked with local communities on Aina or land and ocean education programming at various nonprofits, along with Native Hawaiian organizations that have centered on traditional healing practices. Through her current role as the Hawaii Be Wet and Ocean Guardian Schools Coordinator, she works with the team to include Indigenous local knowledge and engagement with Indigenous communities into NOAA grant competitions. She's joined by Hoku Pihana. Hoku is a Native Hawaiian mother and marine scientist who has worked with the scientific and indigenous communities in Hawaii and the Pacific Islands, or the Pacific for many years. In 2015, she developed the Na Ba'a Mahau Marine Stewardship Program that uses Ba'a or outrigger canoes to care for the near shore and coastal oceans of Hawaii. She currently holds space as the Native Hawaiian Outreach Specialist at the Mokua Papapa Discovery Center for Papa Hanau Mokuakea Marine National Monument. And they are also joined uh, by Melanie Leila Dudley, born and raised in the Ahukuaha of Papa Eku on Hawaii Island. Leila has a strong sense of Kuleana or responsibility to take care of those that came before, encompassing all forms of our ancestors as seen with a Hawaiian worldview. Leila has worked in Aina education for the last 10 years for state and community nonprofits and is now the coordinator for the Kulina Aina program. 
And then closing out our, our panel will be Dr. Jennifer Jenny Selgraf. Jenny is a social ecological researcher with Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. She is passionate about incorporating spatial and social ecological tools into research, monitoring, conservation, and collaborative management of coastal ecosystems. Uh, and I only had time to share with you today uh, a brief uh, bit of these uh, individuals' extensive and exciting bios. So I really encourage you to check them out on the chat website and, and, and follow their work um, more extensively. And so with a big thank you to our panelists uh, for participating and for all of you uh, for joining us today, I'm gonna hand it over to Kelly to get us started. Great. Um, can everybody see my slides? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for the intro. My name is Kelly Dunning. I run the Conservation Governance Lab at Auburn University. All of my contact details are on the screen. Please feel free and reach out. Um, the Conservation Governance Lab specializes in public policy for resilient ecosystems and human communities and no science can happen in a bubble. So I'd like to shout out my co-authors on this short talk, my former grad students who are all off working on really cool federal government conservation projects all over the country and brilliant scientists at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, NCAR. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak and for listening to my talk today on adapting for change in federal sanctuaries. But first, I just wanna acknowledge our LGBT plus visionaries in the room and Wish everybody a very happy pride. All right, so the most important thing that can build resilience is adaptive governance. Beginning with governance, um, let's define it real quick. This is where policymakers use scientific information to change policies, norms, and rules and impact ecosystems, hopefully. The Biden administration is really on the cutting edge in this regard with science-informed decision-making and Governance becomes adaptive when the green parts of the slide are present. These include dialogue opportunities between all stakeholders, inclusion of all rel relevant groups. So when the federal government works with say NGOs and the private sector, and then the opportunity to experiment or try new things in policy responses. Our new paper that we have coming out soon with NCAR shows how NOAA's marine sanctuaries and their stakeholder advisory councils are actually really strong examples of what adaptive governance can and should be. And I say this as a completely independent researcher, I don't work for ONMS. Um, so for example, we collected interviews with Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary stakeholders and independently analyzed over 300 public comments on the new management plan. This is a process known as the restoration blueprint. And we found that Sanctuary Advisory Council through really awe-inspiring levels of stakeholder engagement and collaborative management. Prior to 2022, only 49% of comments were in favor of expanded conservation, but after engagement and collaboration, this increased to a pretty remarkable 65% of public comments favoring expanded conservation efforts and sanctuaries. This demonstrates the power of dialogue and inclusion as well as adaptive governance, and it also shows that Federal sanctuary managers really are thought leaders on this topic. Um, the ideas that I'm gonna talk about in this quick talk, they're all contained in our new book, which comes out this week. If you would like a free PDF, email me and I'll send it to you. It's called The People's Reefs and it's on how essential community participation is for resilient management. This book was actually written with a bunch of my former grad students, two of whom work for NOAA now. I wanna shout out Amanda Alva, Marine and Coastal Social Scientist at NOAA for CSS, and also Sabine Bailey, NOAA Digital Coast Fellow. Shout out to these girls, they're absolutely brilliant and they're the backbone of this research. And 2023 Presidential Management Fellow, Dan Morris, who's now working on resilient recreation for the Forest Service. Our book looks at the coral reefs of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary because these are some of the most biodiverse systems on earth. They're also incredibly vulnerable to climate change, and thus they're a really great learning case for climate vulnerable ecosystems. Many don't know this, but even in really wealthy countries like the United States, reef protection, so things like laws or marine parks, these vary immensely. They're like a patchwork quilt. There's no single agency, park, or law to protect coral reefs. So for example, Florida's 360 mile reef is managed by five different marine parks run by federal, state and local government all across one single reef. Some of these institutions have very limited funding and capacity. And in some places there's totally different rules depending on where you are. Enforcement can be very sparse and in some places it can even be non-existent. 
And because this governance system is so complicated, enhancing resilience is particularly challenging. So our research asks, how are managers responding to climate change? And the resilience implications here are huge since the Florida Reef Tract has lost 98% of its living coral since the 70s due to rising temperatures and pollution. And it's located next to one of America's biggest cities, Miami. Um, this matters because reefs provide excellent buffers for humans from major hurricanes. And this is especially important because one in five people in Miami live below the poverty line. Um, I wanna shout out another current student, 2023 Presidential Management Fellow, soon to be Dr. Greg Johnson's research. He looks closely at the links between vulnerability and resilience for those who want to read more on this topic, and he's starting a job at the executive office of the president next month. Now, I want to talk about structural racism in South Florida. Black residents are two and a half times more likely to face poverty in Miami. Thus, what happens to Miami's reef has a huge equity dimension to it, and degrading reefs leaves marginalized communities more marginal. So I want to talk about experimental policy responses. There's some really interesting experimental policy responses to climate change. Depicted here is one example, innovative coral restoration projects led by the state and federal government, universities, NGOs, private companies. This is where stakeholders are replanting some of the most resilient coral genetically selected for its heat tolerance and disease resilience. Decades of innovation like this is crystallized into an unprecedented federal program called Mission Iconic Reefs, which has been compared to the moonshot. Mission Iconic Reefs is going to ensure that the most innovative restoration can occur with substantial community involvement in reefs that are synonymous with local identity and culture. But where we're falling down as a country is on the issue of equity. The capacity to implement these types of experimental policy responses is really high in wealthy countries or wealthy counties like Florida Keys, Monroe County and low or non-existent in lower income areas like Miami-Dade, making these equity considerations absolutely essential. Stakeholders across the system are also having to adapt to climate change. And in some forthcoming research where we use climate data predictions from NCAR collaborators, we show how stakeholders are gonna need to adapt to build resilience. So for example, dive tourism workers are having to become Uber drivers because of climate shifts in early summer making conditions on the reef really not ideal for tours and recreational and commercial anglers are having to move further north than ever to reach their target species. And these changes are just the beginning. So I'm gonna end where I started going back to this slide. Remember how we said what's essential for human and ecological communities is adaptive governance. Our work adds to this claim, noting experimental policy responses have to do better at dialogue and inclusion in communities where there's substantial inequity, lest we only save reefs adjacent to our wealthiest zip codes. Thank you for your time and uh, questions, I guess, at the end or whenever you want. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Kelly. That was great. Everybody save, save your questions for Kelly so we can uh, dig into that discussion um, at the end. Uh, I'm happy to welcome Mahelani, Boku, and Leila now uh, to share their remarks. All right, mahalo. Thank you so much, Jillian, for the warm introductions and really great presentation, Kelly. Um, we also like to acknowledge the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation and Chow for the support and offering the opportunity for us to share about programs in Hawaii. So mahalo, thank you so much for that. Um, so oftentimes our programs in Hawaii start off with opening protocol, which includes oli or chant and an aloha circle to set our intentions, ground ourselves in place, and call out to the seen and unseen for guidance. Um, but due to the limited time of this presentation, we will have to skip this today, uh, but wanted to set our intentions for this presentation in hopes that we share um, is insightful and inspiring. The next slide. Um, so with that, um, Felina Maikako, welcome everyone to our space. Um, so like Jillian mentioned, I am the contractor with NOAA, so the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And the program that I manage is the Hawaii Be Wet, so Bay Watershed Education and Training Program. Um, and we're happy to be celebrating our 20th anniversary. And like the logo indicates, we are still growing. Next slide. Um, so the National Be Wet Program consists of seven regions across the country. So you can see here in this map. On the next slide. Okay, good, perfect. Um, so the um, NOAA BWET program funds the locally relevant, authentic experiential learning for K-12 students and educators through meaningful watershed educational experiences, or MEWIs. 
Um, so MIWIs are multi-stage activities that include learning both outdoors and in the classroom that aims to increase understanding and stewardship of watersheds and related ecosystems. So whether working with students directly or providing professional development to educators, BWET grants empower students to investigate local and global environmental issues that affect their lives, choices, and communities. MIWIs help connect students with their local environment and equip them to make decisions and take actions that contribute to stronger, sustainable, and equitable communities. Next slide. So the Hawaii BWET program, next slide. Um, our region spans across the state. So not only the um, main Hawaiian islands, but also includes the Northwestern Hawaiian islands, Papahana Mokuakea. Next slide, please. Um, so our Hawaii BWET priorities um, include the national BWET priorities as well, like climate science, but expands to include an additional priority content area that focuses on indigenous and local knowledge or ILK. And this is what makes our Hawaii BWET program unique. We also include NOAA place-based watershed frameworks like Ahupua'a knowledge and Ahupua'a stewardship. And Ahupua'a is a land division that typically expands from the mountain to the sea. Um, next year, all BWET funding opportunities will include a DEIJ, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Justice Statement. Um, other DEIJ initiatives include partnerships with community organizations. Next slide, please. So furthermore, um, important core values that we like to advocate for in the Hawaii BWEP program is building pilina or long-term relationships and reciprocity. So several in-person site visits were held on various islands to build this pilina with grantees, teachers, students, and communities, along with showing support for their project activities and initiatives. Next slide. Um, in addition, um, we want to increase efforts to build capacity in our local communities. Um, so several grant trainings were held throughout the islands to assist with grant applications and submissions. So beyond creating opportunities for local communities to apply for Indigenous and local knowledge projects, we also need to get them the funds to the organizations uh, to do the work. So one way to do this is to give them the tools and help them, help them build and write stronger proposals. Next slide. Um, so beyond the BWET program, um, there's also the Ocean Guardian School program, which engages pre-K to 12 students um, in, in protection and conservation of local watersheds, the ocean, and special ocean areas like National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, so students can carry out hands-on stewardship projects on school campuses and in their local community that address an issue affecting the health of local watersheds and the ocean. Um, so there are five different project pathways that are pictured here that a school can select from, ranging from creating a school garden to energy and ocean health. Next slide. Um, so this year, the Ocean Guardian School application included optional questions about engaging with Indigenous communities. Uh, we also highly encourage that ethical and equitable compensation was included in the budget for their time, knowledge, and expertise of the Indigenous representative and or the organization they're working with. So again, this is another really huge step for um, the NOAA Ocean Guardian School program and also for NOAA as a federal agency. Next slide, please. So in addition to engaging with Indigenous communities, a priority for us in the Pacific, we really wanted to ensure that other Pacific regions are represented, included, and offered the same opportunity in their communities and schools. So starting off in Hawaii and expanding to American Samoa, we worked hard to identify funding that allowed expansion to Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, so CNMI. Um, so with the support of the NOAA Marine Debris Program and the NOAA Pacific Region Engagement Board, this was possible. So we're really excited for that expansion across the Pacific. Next slide, please. So at the end of the school year, and once the project has been success successfully completed, the school is awarded a banner. So in Hawaii, we have weaved in Indigenous and local knowledge through the Kumulipo, which is the Hawaiian creation chant, and Olelo no Eau, or Proverbs, or wise sayings, along with a beautiful representation of our Hawaiian species. Next slide, please. Um, so from the Ocean Guardian School program, we created um, the specific exchange network. Um, so the Ocean Guardian School coordinators from Alaska, American Samoa, Guam, and Hawaii have created the Pacific Exchange Network, or PEN. Uh, we are a group of Pacific Islanders serving Pacific Island and Alaskan schools, communities, and Indigenous Native people. 
This network expands beyond the Ocean Guardian schools in our regions to include other local schools to provide them with supplemental services and motivate them to become future Ocean Guardians. We have included partners from Palau and will be expanding to CNMI, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, next school year. Um, and our purpose is to provide opportunities for collaboration across the Pacific, encourage students to learn and interact with other Pacific Island and Alaskan students, and provide local and Indigenous specific presenters and STEM topics that can inspire them to become better stewards of their own homes. Next slide. Um, so with all of that, we hope that this presentation leaves you inspired because at the end, um, we do all of this, next slide, um, for the Lahui, for the people, and our aina, our land, and kai, which is our ocean. So now to pass the presentation on to some of our current BWET grant recipients, um, Pilina Aina and Nava'a Mawo. Mahalo. Mahalo nui e mahi alani. Um, Aloha nui kako. Uh, my name is Melanie Leila Dudley. I I'm from Hilo Paliku on the island of Hawaii, and I am the program coordinator for an environmental education program um, called Pilina Aina. We're incredibly humbled to be a part of the Noa Biwet family. We're a collaboration of the following partners whose logos you see on the screen. And the Pico, or the center of our program, is really anchored in the idea of Iola Oi, Iola Makone. Our lives are dependent on yours, and your life is dependent on ours acknowledging and respecting the reciprocal long-term relationship that we have with Aina, as well as land is chief and as humans, we are its stewards or servants, further acknowledging with a Hawaii Lifeways lens that Aina is our family, our greatest ancestor and a part of who we are and therefore that we have a responsibility to care for Aina. In Hawaiian language, pilina means relationship. And Aina means land, ocean, or that which feeds. So this name really reflects exactly what we do in our program and what we see as the answer to helping our communities that are getting impacted by climate change. For us to build pilina or relationships with Aina, Aina including all of our indigenous and local knowledge held and passed down in Hawaii life ways. By being introduced to Aina in this familial and Hawaii way and being given the time to develop long term relationships with our special places, whether it be our backyard or local forest or coral reef, a sense of koleana or responsibility gets instilled upon us. This is our answer. Everyone forming their own relationships and becoming informed members of our community who are in these impacted landscapes and can then know how to adapt to whatever change climate change brings. Um, we have a suite of programs which provide immersive and empowering um, Aina based learning opportunities and education resources that encourage, facilitate, and enhance these relationships with Aina. So, these experiences anchored here, right, in Aina and place, Hawaiian language, Hawaiian culture, and Hawaii stewardship values cultivate a deeper and personally transformative understanding of Hawaii's native ecosystems and also provide enhanced secondary education and career preparedness for youth. We host a variety of programs, as you can see here. Um, and in the following photos, you know, these really serve the K to 12 students and teachers as well as community members. Um, teachers, however, impact thousands of students through the span of their careers, who then impact thousands of other students, other community members. Today, we really want to highlight our BWET sponsored teacher training program called Pilina Kayaulu Community Relationships. This is a two year program where teachers are taught Hawaii life ways to be able to communicate with and connect to Aina and even better connect to their students by learning traditional chants, stories, historical accounts, traditional proverbs, science and much more. In this program, and um, these are all images from this particular program, um, teachers spend the duration of the first year in the single Ahupua'a land division of Pu'uwa'awa'a, building a relationship with this place and learning from its stewards on multiple instances and in multiple locations in the uplands and also at the ocean. Teachers learn from government ag agencies, international nonprofits, and lineal descendant grassroots community groups about how these stewards how they steward this aina in this single ahupua'a that is in the backyard of where these teachers and these students live and work. This was intentional, right? Really focusing on this group of teachers who live in this particular place and really learning from the stewards about how they're adapting to the impacts that climate change is and will continue to bring, including in this particular area, sea level rise, wildfires, and, and more. Um, during the second year, teachers will be able to bring their students to begin or build upon their relationship 
with this place of Pu'ua Awa'a. Learn from these same stewards and have the opportunity to actively be a part of the climate solution by engaging in forest and fish pond restoration activities. Then as a class, they will have to come up with some type of environmental adv advocacy project to further support this place and its stewards in the face of climate change. In this day and age, how do we even get students to care? We cannot care about something like the environment if we don't know it or if we don't understand it. When we not only acknowledge, but begin to understand these ancestors of ours in a Hawaii perspective, regardless of our background, because we drink of, of this water, we eat of this soil and breathe of this air, whether or not we are native Hawaiian or, or are local to this place, we have a kuleana, a responsibility to this place. And when we have informed students, teachers and community members, these people become advocates for their place and help us combat climate change by eventually becoming these stewards, regardless of the career path they choose and in helping to spread this awareness to others. Furthermore, through these programs, students are able to learn or practice Hawaiian language, which gives a unique peek into our past and indigenous and local knowledge held in literary resources where many of these answers for climate resilience are held. Kupuna, the people of old, went through severe changes in weather in these specific localities and recorded what happens and what they did in our Hawaiian language newspapers, our traditional stories and historical accounts. This is another way that we will address climate change. Ikawa ma mua, ikawa ma hope. By looking to our ancestors and people of old, how they adapted in times of severe weather, and then applying these lessons to our context today with our modern tools, science, and people, we can confront what is to come. This all starts first by building a relationship with Aina and understanding that Aina is family, our greatest ancestor. Mahalo nui for listening and for supporting indigenous and local knowledge and communities. And now I will. And now I'll pass it on to Ms. Hokupihana. Aloha mai kako, mahalo nui and avahine. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Mahalani and Leila. Beautiful presentations. I love seeing the faces. So I want to close out our session with just sharing about um, the program that um, we created, Nava'a Ma'o Marine Stewardship Program. And we perpetuate the practices of our ancestors to care for our oceans using our native tools, language, and sciences in ocean stewardship. So next slide, please. The background of our program was established between the pibina that I have with Va'a through my papa. Um, it was uh, something that um, really grounded me in understanding the purpose and function of awakening the ancestral identity of Va'a beyond the competitive nature of our outrigger canoes and really awakening that piece of, um, of them that is the, the, the tool or the vessel that we use to care for our oceans, connect with our communities and, um, and feed us. Yeah, so that was the background that established it, this program with this interest to weave these in, indigenous and institutional practices together to care for our oceans. Next slide, please. So our mission is to perpetuate the practices of our kupuna, of our ancestors, by using our native Hawaiian tools, languages, and science to care for our ocean. We have a vision of fleets of va'a caring for our oceans. And our work is inspired by our mission. And the approach is defined by the dream of implementing more holistic, less invasive marine stewardship practices that are scientifically rigorous, community-driven, and culturally rooted. Next slide, please. <sighs> So I really want to touch on the vai vai or the values of our program that I'll kind of dig deeper into a little bit here. But when we observe nakilo aina, when we start to make um, observations, we create a relationship with place that evokes that malama aina, that desire to care for that space. And as we care and we strengthen our relationship with that space, our aina becomes momona, the aina momona, that fruitful and productive land, and that, that reciprocal relationship between kia'i and aina, right, the stewards in that space. And that's reflected in the health and wellness of our lands and our people. So the final is the result of aina mao, reaching that state of sustainability that comes from these fruitful and productive relationships and stewardship that's evoked by all of these values. Next slide, please. So some of the ways that we do this in Nava'a Mao, we highlight three key components of our program. The Honue Yakea Voyaging Program that supports the next generation of marine stewards through, through Va'a. Our cultural exchanges where we exchange with other Va'a communities 
um, in Hawaii and throughout the Pacific to learn how we use VA to care for ourselves, our communities, and our spaces. And then our community work days that enables our community to come out and participate in the practices that we do and learn how we blend indigenous and institutional sciences to care for and steward our oceans. Next slide, please. So I really wanna focus on our Honuaiakea Voyaging Program because I think this is a really significant piece that highlights the importance of making a long-term commitment and establishing strong relationships within our community. So this particular program has made a generational commitment to the next generation of marine stewards through Va'a. So we have are now in our third cohort of students, but once you're a part of our program, you're always a part of our program. So you are invited to return and participate and continue to build on your knowledge, your skills, the relationships that you've established within yourself with the Va'a and others that are a part of these programs or part of this experience. So with that, I kind of want to walk you through how we identify and really strengthen the identity of our kids and help them understand the value of using our um, native tools, languages, and sciences to care for our oceans here in Hawaii. And then the product of all of that through the relationships and the exchanges that we've built over time. So next slide, please. So to begin with, when we establish that relationship through observation and spending time within a place, we start to enable that place to speak to us and share about itself. Over time, through one interaction, there's one understanding of observations that you've made. But as you build on those observations and let that space speak to you and have it tell itself about you, you begin to understand how you choose to interact and care for that space. So these are images of the kids learning how to voyage on um, Laihoi, our double hull sailing canoe, making their observations and using their hands and their skills to, to really uh, um, digest all of those observations they're making within their environment. So next slide. So that through their observations and establishing that relationship to place, that desire of uh, malama aina is awakened, right? They start to establish that intimate relationship with place, not only with place, but within themselves and amongst each other, which really grounds them in their stewardship and helps them to understand how we work as a lahui, as a va'a community to care for our oceans. Next slide. And with that, we evoke this aina momona, this reciprocal relationship between kiai and aina that's reflected in how we steward and evoking more holistic, less invasive ways of engaging with our marine environment, gathering our, the information that we would like to learn from the, our marine environment and really doing it in a way that is grounded in the identity of kanakawiwi or Native Hawaiian practices and understanding. Next slide. And that results in our aina mao, right? That that cultural and environmental sustainability that we're thriving for, not only within our communities and within our oceans, but also within ourselves. We found that within this program, the students have found a value within themselves that we didn't really recognize or aim for, but it was, it was a bonus. It was something that was evoked within them when they saw that they were important. Each person has a value and purpose and function within the canoe and gives um, value to that. So that was really important. So with closing, what I'd like to do is just share a little bit of the mo'olelo that we do within our program that reflects and tells our story of our stewardship here in Hawaii. Next slide. Mahalo Nui for sharing the time with us today and allowing us to share our work here in Hawaii with all of you. Hey, Malama. Thank you all. That was wonderful. Um, 
Okay, so hold, hold questions for them as well. Hopefully we'll have a couple of minutes, but um, right now we're gonna turn it over to, to Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. Hi everyone, um, I'm just gonna share my screen with you. Um, can you see that now? Um, okay, so um, my name is Jenny Sugrath and um, as Jillian said, I'm a researcher with the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, which is, and I'm also fighting a terrible cold, so apologies. <coughs> um, I am a researcher in California and um, so um, what I want to talk to you guys about today is some of our work in the Channel Islands to understand human dimensions research, which is focused on the relationships between people and nature. And I think that um, it's really important, but often is underlooked and, and is not a focus of research on the oceans. And so one of the reasons that the Channel Islands has decided that this is a really big priority for us is because several years ago, um, we did a condition report, which is one of the reportings that just all sanctuaries are required to do. And when we did, we found that um, the oh, we didn't actually have a lot of information to allow us to assess the condition and changes in ways that humans related to the ocean, particularly in relationship to ecosystem services. And so one of the things that we decided to do from that is that it was really important to improve our understanding of human dimensions, and then also to incorporate this research into the management and into our work to address climate change. And actually one of the outcomes was this is that they hired me to help them do this because um, they didn't have any staff at the time who focused on human dimensions aspects of research. And so I think one of the important questions then is what can human dimensions research do for me or why is it important as a management agency to incorporate this? And there's many different reasons why. I think that these include the fact that management is much more important when people are engaged it can help um, understanding, or because there's increasing pressures and threats on the oceans like climate change, we actually require data to understand how these are affecting the ocean and also the communities that are dependent upon the ocean and have a relationship with the ocean. It can also help us prioritize culturally important species, experienced in places, because these, these things are knowledge that's held within local communities, but doesn't necessarily make it to man people that are making management decisions about the ocean. It can also help us understand how management impacts different groups. So one of the things that often happens when there's marine spatial planning is that the groups that have data are groups like the shipping industry and military and other um, sort of large organizations that have better infrastructure. And so if it, what it means though is if we don't have information about other communities that you can provide to that planning process, then it often just gets overlooked altogether, even if it's recognized to be important. And so collecting this information can be critically important to having more equitable management. In addition, there's also a growing availability of technologies like satellite data and computational ability that allow us to look at some of the more high tech solutions to managing this problem. So I thought I would start, I would kind of go through today some examples um, of first just sort of giving you an overview of some examples of what this might look like. So some of the types of questions you can address include things like ecosystem services, cultural practices, equity and environmental justice, indigenous and local knowledge, economics, and as well as the uses and activities that take place in different places, such as a sanctuary program. And so I thought I would just give you an example of a few different projects that I've done in this. The, the first I did before I worked at the sanctuaries, and it was a review we did of how adaptive capacity influences the responses of communities to climate impacts. And so um, basically, if you think of stressors, there's a variety of different types um, that affect communities ranging from overfishing to climate crises. These interact together and in the adaptive capacity sort of um, theoretical world, you can look at different domains of how people are, can respond and what might influence their response. And this includes things like learning and knowledge, access to assets, diversity and flexibility, and governance and institutions. And in reviewing this, we just, we, there, um, there's also a lot of literature that, that theorizes that people communities can respond by adapting, reacting, or coping, or what we call the ARC response. And so when we did um, the summary, we found that um, communities responded in a variety of ways, and these were influenced by these different domains. And so we found that one example, communities, if they were impacted, that they, if they had access to assets, 
either governance and institutions or diversity and flexibility, and then some combination of learning and knowledge and nat natural capital or not, um, that that would lead to them having an adaptive response so that they were basically able to see, have an impact happen to them and then look forward and try to change their behavior so that in the future, they, they were in a, a better, more resilient place to deal with change. Um, and then another type of pathway that we found um, but those at the household level as opposed to the community level was that even if they didn't have to have assets, but they needed to have diversity of flexibility, there needed to be supporting governance and institutions, that they could either have learning and knowledge or natural capital, and that that would lead to, community, to households having an adaptive response. Um, and then another uh, project I thought I'd talk about quickly is a project that I did last summer with a great student. Um, uh, named Eva Jones, and we did a review of what led to leads to more equitable co-management between federal agencies and tribes, which is currently in prep. But we basically looked at five different dimensions of co-management, including compensation and funding, communication, formal dispute resolution, the attitude of the agency towards the tribe, and the acknowledgement of the agency towards of the tribe. And we scored each dimension and looked at formal and informal pathways. And so for this project, we looked at examples from 52 record, federally recognized tribes in 14 states with five agencies. And we focused on continental US and Alaska because of the things that we thought that the pathways that happened in Hawaii, which you guys have just heard about some of that are a bit different than what happens in the rest of the country. Um, and so if we, if we have a situation where there is a mutual responsibility between federal agencies and the tribes for managing natural resources, um, in our preliminary results, we found that there was better um, outcomes and better shared management if there was either funding for tribal participation. Um, a second pathway was that there was acknowledgement of tribal rights and a positive attitude by the agency towards tribal partners. And a third was that there was a formal dispute resolution process so that if there was disagreements, there was a formal way. And it wasn't just that one group could, strong, usually the federal agency, could strong arm the other into, into doing what they wanted. Um, and so then a third example that I thought I would talk about is a grant that my colleague Tim Frawley, who's at UC Santa Cruz and with NIMS, and I just got from the California Ocean Protection Council. And this just started a few weeks ago, so we're at the very beginning of it. But we're doing a project to evaluate climate impacts to ocean access for disadvantaged communities and tribes in California. And so this is with a variety of different partners, um, and we'll be working with a variety of different students as well. And we're going to ask a bunch of questions about what are the values, activities, and assets to coastal, coastal as, sorry, access to coastal oceans, how these vary among different communities in different parts of the state, and how benefits might be impacted by climate change, and, and in, including if marine protected areas such as sanctuaries can help mitigate some of those impacts. Um, and so this is with a variety of community partners that are that we have funded um, to participate. And this summer we'll be doing interviews with key informants from those um, from those partner agencies. And then the following summer, we're gonna do surveys with a variety of different community members, um, which is so very excited about this project too. So um, in summary, that's just some of the ways that I think of that research can help support um, community resilience to climate impacts. And um, so I'd love to, in our discussion, to hear any questions or ideas that people have. And also I wanted to just promote that the Channel Islands is a really great place to do this type of research and we're really excited about it. And so if any of you who are listening or are interested in that, please follow up with me and I'd love to talk about those possibilities. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jenny, and, and a big thanks to, to all of our speakers. Um, I think, you know, we are, are sadly at times, so we might unfortunately not have time for Q&A, but, but reach out to us and, and, and look into these folks' work, and we can always be uh, in touch more uh, offline. And so thank you all for your time and your participation, um, and enjoy the rest of chow, everybody.